going to set this up in a little different way because we've, we've kind of talked about the, the needs for uh, uh, building soil, improving our soil, how it's going to help with our whole aspect that we call climate resilience, uh, which is a little bit like the word sustainability. Everybody knows kind of what it is, but nobody has a really good definition. That's really what climate resilience uh, is all about as well. We're still in the process of defining that. But the, the key part of all of this is going to be what I consider soil health. And it'll lead into some of the things that Rich is talking about. And to, to put it into perspective for you, we did an analysis of, of looking at uh, uh, county level yields uh, relative to the National Crop Commodity Productivity Index, one of the, the parameters you have in your, uh, your soils databases. And if we look at the, the quality of that soil, which is really what that metric is all about, and plotted it against the mean county yields, and each one of those dots represent the average yield for 40 years, uh, that the better the soils, the higher the average county yield. Uh, and you kind of look at that and say, well, I, I know that. <laughs> but what is a lot of times is not known is the fact that we have producers that have poor soils who manage their crop as if they have high productivity. They are putting in the same level of inputs, they're putting in the same pieces of that puzzle, and so when we start looking at this from a different standpoint, it's a matter of how do we begin to get producers to understand what soil improvement and what soil health really means from a different perspective. Uh, those data points that are in, from Nebraska out there, it's not the, the fact that Nebraska knows how to grow soybeans more than, than Iowa, it's a fact that we just cherry pick the irrigated counties. <laughs> so if you supply water, <laughs> you can solve your soil problem. So if you timely supply the water that that crop needs, even with a poor quality soil, you can produce a pretty good crop. So it really becomes about water management. And you go back to what we talked about in the first piece of this, that climate change from agriculture is really about a water management perspective. Of corn uh, production is that same aspect applies to the higher the, uh, the soil, higher the quality of the soil, the higher the productivity. And so what we actually did was uh, plot... Uh, I'm sorry, which one? Oh, just go ahead to the next one. Okay. We actually plotted the NCCPI for all the ag soils across the, the Midwest. And so we're really beginning to look at this and, and look at the uh, where do we have high quality soils? What do we see in terms of yield variation within those counties? Uh, how do we begin to look at this? And then we're going to narrow it down to actually how we look at individual fields within that and saying, what's the uh, NCCPI on an individual field basis? Uh, and how does that influence uh, all the decisions that we make across that? So, you know, you look at Iowa, Illinois, uh, parts of Minnesota, this is, you know, where we have our high quality soils degrading off. And we've done the same thing. We've mapped uh, uh, precipitation uh, and temperatures across these same counties as well. And go, just go to the next one. Uh, here's really what we were looking at. <laughs> we get it down to this, this soil aspect and saying, what's it really take to have a high quality soil? And you look at all the different roots that are in there, you see that large uh, earthworm channel that's out there, you see the aggregate stability that's in there, and you really begin to say, what's it take to have an improvement in that soil quality index, or the NCCPI. Uh, and, and how do we look at that? Because that NCCPI is related to uh, productivity of our soils. Uh, it's related to organic matter. How do we improve this overall piece of the puzzle? And so if we just take and look at, at a field average, uh, and this is a a stylized yield map uh, where we went through and smoothed it all out. You can see that those green areas are low productivity, uh, purple areas are the high productivity soils out there. Those, and when we start looking at an individual field basis, is that those low yielding parts of the field are really related to soil water availability during grain filling. Uh, it's the lack of soil water 
during that July August period that leads to that yield variation because what we see when we look across this field is that at tasseling time in corn across the Midwest unless something dramatic has happened that field is very very uniform it takes little water to grow that crop to that point uh, it really uh, becomes a uniform and then we see all the variability begin to increase in that field from tasseling time to maturity and because if you remember back to that graph where we talk about water use that's where we have the bulk of the water use going on uh, by the crop it is also the point in which we have the uh, limited amount of precipitation coming on so the crop water demand is a function of, of how much the atmosphere wants, how much the soil can supply, and unlike anything else, we cannot deficit spend in the soil water balance. Once you run out of water, you run out of water. <laughs> you can't borrow against the last season, and you can't borrow against next season. Uh, and so that is really limited in there. And so what we see is all this variability in fields is really a function of soil water availability. Uh, that's the number one factor that causes it. So we can begin to think about how do we change that soil and improve that soil to be able to improve its water holding capacity from that standpoint. And you look at it from, from this standpoint, these are uh, soil survey data. Uh, and it's out of Hudson's work. Uh, we look at percent organic matter by weight and percent uh, water by volume. Uh, as we degrade uh, soils, Across there, we see a declining organic matter, uh, and we see sands and silts, uh, silt loams across the top of that very, very rapid increase. So if we change uh, organic matter from 1% to 4.5%, we would double our available water holding capacity. And, and we not only double that available water holding capacity, we change a number of different things within that soil as well. Uh, we, not only as we change that organic matter near the surface, we change the infiltration rate, which allows more water to move down into the deeper profiles uh, as well. And if and so, we can we can either degrade it or we can increase it as, as we go forward uh, from this standpoint. And so we we've been looking, and, and this is a cooperative project that we actually have between NRCS uh, and ourselves right now, is to refine this, but to then to look and say. What sort of conservation practices do you have to put on the land and the different soils to begin to improve organic matter over time? And what would this mean in terms of crop productivity and crop stability to, to offset some of this climate or to really to build a climate resilient system uh, as we go forward? Uh, <clears throat> I just did some things on this. There are uh, county yields getting back in four different counties. Uh, the upper lines are, are what we call the, the upper quadrant analysis uh, in all of this. And what we find uh, is that 20% of our yield loss is occurring 80% of the time, and it's all due to water availability. So that <coughs> upper part of that profile in terms of what we're losing in terms of yield is within our management capacity. It's, and these are the extreme events that we see where we really are way below normal precipitation, really high temperature events, the things that cause yield loss. But 80% of that yield variation is within our control. And it's in our control because of how do we manage the soils that are out there and how do we manage the water resource that goes with them. So that gives us tremendous capacity in terms of being able to stabilize yields among years, but also to improve yield capacity uh, across the field. And improving yield capacity is, isn't so much about improving that really good part of the field already, it's about improving that poor part of the field, uh, that where we see our yield limitation coming from. Just to give you another example of this, this is uh, an aircraft photo of a field in early August and late August. Uh, this is a soybean field that's just west of Ames. Uh, very, very uniform, uh, and then all you see is the, uh, the only variation is the waterways in that. This is three weeks later on the right side. Uh, in three weeks it didn't rain, and so what we see is all of that this, uh, loss of green leaf area, all that variation is occurring. 
Those darker parts of the field yielded 65 bushels. Those lighter yellow parts, 25 bushels. So in three weeks, we lost 40 bushels to the acre because of water limitation. And so you think about what that would mean if we would just take and improve the capacity of that soil to hold one or two more inches of what that's worth. And we see that same phenomena occur in lots of fields across Iowa, and it's really because of the fact that we don't have the water resource available. So when we think about soil health, there's a real dollar metric to it in terms of yields and what it means for yield stability, not only among years, within years. So we look at, look at those areas of the field is those light colored areas in this map here only produce high yields when you have that perfect growing season. And I can tell you that going into the future, we're going to have less and less perfect growing seasons. And so that's why the soil health piece, all of this becomes a much more efficient. So here's the keys to soil health, from my perspective. We've got to have soil biological activity that then gives rise to physical properties and then to chemical processes. We tend to think that the physical properties are where we start, but in reality, it's the biology. Uh, we're going to have to improve the biology as we go forward. To, to think about this from a different perspective, is that think about linking this to the carbon, water, nitrogen cycles. Uh, cycles that go on above the, the soil surface and, and cycles that occur <clears throat> within the soil out there. You really think about how we drive this overall process that we call agriculture. We, we're, we're basically solar energy capture devices uh, in ag. Uh, we're capturing all that sunlight. Uh, we're putting into the carbon cycle by photosynthesis. Uh, we respire it back out uh, in all of this, and, and that goes on both above and ground, uh, above and below ground. We have the water cycle. Uh, we're evaporating water uh, from the plant. We're tr transpiring water. We're infiltrating water. We're leaching water through that. We've got the nitrogen cycle, both from fixation as well as mineralization, denitrification, all of this. And so these cycles are going on simultaneously, and we tend to think about them we talk about the carbon cycle, we talk about the water cycle, we talk about the nitrogen cycle, but those, and I can put all the other cycles on there, but it gets a little complex, is that those three cycles are all interrelated. They are not moving independently. They are all intrinsically linked together, and when we start thinking about how do we improve our soil out there, is that they're influencing the carbon, water, and nitrogen cycle simultaneously. And so it's not a matter of one point. And that's what makes a lot of this very, very complex in terms of these understandings is that we need to really start thinking about a multi-dimensional space <laughs> that's out there. And it really becomes a different viewpoint uh, in all of this. And so I'm going to start with the whole biology uh, piece of this puzzle is that we're going to talk about the, the simple aspects of having crop residue on the surface because that crop residue on the surface has multiple benefits that are out there. One that in terms of, of reducing the rainfall energy so it allows water to move in that. It also moderates the temperature extremes that that system goes through. <clears throat> but actually what it's doing is it's feeding this complex soil biology that's going to work hard for all of us underneath the surface. And so what we're doing is you think about the fact that, and I'll just use this example here, is how many people went out in short sleeves this morning? <laughs> no, you put on a heavy coat for lots of different reasons because you wanted to moderate your environment uh, out there. Uh, the same thing that that residue is doing on the surface is just moderating the environment that that uh, microbiology is going through. And so that soil residue layer Yes, it does moderate the temperature extreme. It moderates the, uh, the water extremes in there because biology, just like us, wants to be comfortable. And it's not going to work in areas that it's uncomfortable in. And so in a bare soil, we take and go through massive temperature extremes from day to day. It goes through massive uh, water extremes from, from rainfall event to rainfall event. 
and we wonder why it's not working for us. It's not working because we put it in such an extreme environment that you wouldn't work either. <laughs> and so how you react <laughs> to the extreme weather is think about how that biology reacts. And if you aren't comfortable in that, that biology isn't comfortable. Uh, and so the whole residue layer just sort of moderates that environment to allow it to do its thing uh, that's out there. And we can think about this same aspect from a passive blanket with crop residue or an active blanket under uh, a cover crop. And the active blanket gives one more piece of advantage in all of this because the active blanket is not only active in terms of, of water, uh, it's active in terms of carbon. It's basically putting carbon uh, back into that soil uh, in terms of root exudates, fresh root material that basically feed that biology. Because you think about a corn system uh, in here, and we talked about why that corn system wasn't accruing organic matter over time, is because it just doesn't feed the biology long enough. And so when we add more and more crop residue out there, we're adding more and more food source out there. Think about if I only fed you from June, July, August, and maybe into September, and said, well, you're kind of on your own <laughs> the rest of the year. That's really the way we're treating our biology when we have a summer uh, system. And you see crop rotations having a much different response in terms of organic matter than does a, a corn soybean system. It's basically because of how we manage the overall feeding of this biology. Um, and so when we look at this, what we've seen over time is that the better we can make that soil and the better we can improve the biology, the, uh, the better we increase the greenness of this plant. And we build a simple little index that we just took the, the chlorophyll readings from tasseling until maturity black layer, uh, and we looked at yield. The greener I can keep that plant, the higher the yield. Again, another no-brainer. You think about this from the standpoint, you go, well, that makes sense. Yes, it makes sense, but we need some metrics to go along with it. And the metrics are that we can begin to show this because one of the things that we see in all of this is that the better we make the biology in that soil is why we end up with a greener plant because it's cycling nutrients back to that plant all the time. And so now we have a way of quantifying really what that biology is doing to us from a different perspective. And it's doing it because we're able to, to quantify it from a different perspective. Other aspects, and because everybody says, well, where, where are the components of conservation agriculture? Uh, when we do that residue, is that that residue management has both a short-term impact and a long-term impact. The short-term impact is it reduces soil water evaporation uh, because that residue layer basically prevents the evaporation of water from that surface. It increases the infiltration of, of rainfall uh, or irrigation events because it absorbs all that energy and allows that rain to move down through, preserves aggregate stability, allows a lot of better capture, reduces the overall evaporation rate even it would, when we grow plants in standing stubble. Uh, and if we think about the different perspectives and all of this. Long term, uh, we increase the soil water holding capacity through improved organic matter content. We do continue to improve that. And we actually improve the organic matter content right near the surface. We tend to sample the six inch depth and we have a hard time seeing that. But if you sample that upper one inch, you see all sorts of things occur and change very dramatically. And it's a, actually that upper half to one inch of the soil that really is very, very dramatic in terms of the water exchange and the gas exchange between the soil and the atmosphere. It only takes a 30 second of an inch of crust to limit gas exchange between the soil and the atmosphere. <laughs> so you put that fine layer of silt and, and degraded soil on there, basically we've limited exchange rates back and forth. And so if we want to continue to allow this biology work because Biology requires oxygen, <laughs> is that we need to make sure that our soil is in a condition to allow the oxygen exchange to go back and forth. Because if you're not limited, if you're limited with oxygen, what's your productivity? Zero. Zero. <laughs> yeah. And so 
think about it from that perspective is that we want to set this all up in a way in which the biology can work uh, from that perspective. So if we want to build soil health, the first thing we've got to do is create a stable home for the biological systems. We can't have the biology system going up and down and all sorts of swings back and forth and expect it to do its job. Because then we'll end up increasing the value of soil for production. We'll move that index up and increase the, the average yield over time. Uh, so crop residue benefits, we come back, we think about feeding this complex uh, in there, is that we need to be thinking about a living soil that's out there. And it's not only just the microbes, we've got everything from mammals, moles, gophers, groundhogs, things like this, the megafauna uh, that's out there that really do a lot of disruption of, of soil, clear down to algae, uh, either green or blue-green algae, in a really high quality soil, we have the equivalent of two African elephants per acre in terms of biomass. So you think about this from a standpoint, and it's much more visual to think about. If you stood out in your picture window and overlooked 160 acres, <laughs> you'd, see 300, <laughs> you'd see 320 elephants standing out there. And, and immediately, what would your thought be if you woke up in the morning and there was 320 acres? 320 elephants standing out there. And I, the answers to that question have, re, have ranged in all from, A, what's elephants going for uh, <laughs> on the spot market, uh, you know, to uh, how big a gun do I have to use to shoot that elephant, um, to the, op the optimum answer is what's it going to take to feed those elephants. Uh, but if we think about this, is that those elephants are consuming roughly 500 pounds of material per day. They're eating a lot of material. And so when you think about all of this different activity and, and you look at what really happens in an active soil, is that there is no such thing as a no-till system. If you get an active biological system, there is movement back and forth in that profile that's beyond belief uh, in this. We're changing and moving all sorts of soil around. You see that uh, in all of this. And so all of this has to be working together. And, and thinking about this aspect is that we're not going to improve soil health until we stabilize our bacteria, stabilize our biological activity within that. Because that's what's really what's cycling a lot of this around. And so it's really about managing that uh, system from that perspective. So it gets back to this point right here is that if we think about moving that index up so we can improve our mean yields, it's really about how do we improve our soils. And improving our soils both from a water perspective. Um, you take that green area of that field and begin to improve it from a standpoint of, of improving water holding capacity, a number of those different things, improving nitrogen cycling. What we see in all of this is as we begin to improve the biology, is that we now begin to see all sorts of changes within this. And we just finished a study uh, in which we had 12 columns of soil. These are 14 inch columns by 24 inches. Uh, these are undisturbed cores. To put it in a different perspective, that's a 300 pound core of soil. And we instrumented it with CO2 sensors, uh, uh, Vault organic compound sensors, uh, we collected root exudates once a week out of it. We got a whole series of parameters. What we saw is we begin to improve the biology of that soil. We improved the respiration rate. We improved the biology. We improved the composition of the, the exudates out of that. We changed all of that in a short period of time. And so we're beginning now to get to a mechanistic understanding of really how does soil change when we begin to do these things. I mean, these are the types of questions that we need to be asking. How do we change the soil to be able to do that? So with that, come back to questions so that I set Rich up. To <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> that was my job. Well. Okay, do we have any uh, questions for Jerry? And, uh, question, um, just kind of to put in perspective, would you have to know, you looked at, um, the water holding capacity, if you increase soil organic matter from one and a half or one percent to four and a half percent, 
How much water holding capacity have we lost from when we first tilled the prairie soils till now on average in Iowa? Do you have a feel for that? I would say that it's just a mental calculation of, of that. And, and I'll, I'll repeat the question is how much, how much water holding capacity have we lost in our soils from where we were at in the prairie soil to where we're at today? And I would say we've probably lost half of our water holding capacity. Uh, and we've, we've lost it not only in the upper surface, we've lost it also from the standpoint that we no longer have the aggregate stability. And so we're not getting the infiltration rate going out into the deep profile. So we see that in a lot of cases, and, and what we've looked at in, uh, in alfalfa is one of the, the, the crops that, that is quite interesting from that standpoint, is that we see a biennial cycle in alfalfa production. And I think that we see a biennial cycle because they, it, it grows down, it's a deep-rooted crop, it extracts all that moisture, and it's limited in productivity the next year because it takes a while for that, the system to recharge um, and to get back up, and then it comes back in again. So, and we're looking at that and seeing just really what's that mean in terms of this. And so I think we, we really, have, Eric, have got to pay attention to the fact that we have lost a lot of this. Uh, and if we had our prairie soil <coughs> systems in the conditions that, uh, with our modern genetics and things like this, we could easily produce that 300 bushels that everybody wants. Wow. I mean, we, we had our, our biggest yield in 2012 was 290 bushels. That's just shy of 300 bushels. And that was on what a, a system that would probably considered fairly close to prairie. We had some grass strips that we took back out, put it in to, to rearrange some plots and everything else. And in 2012, 290 bushels is a pretty impressive crop. Uh, and again, limited rainfall, but it extracted, it had the capability of extracting moisture to seven feet. Now next year I didn't do so well because <laughs> I didn't have any moisture left. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why that biennial cycle occurs. I had to reach Yeah, if we take a look at crop sequestration uh, back into the soil, and one of the things that we see, in, like in corn, is that if, if we're talking about a 200 bushel corn crop, uh, you know, we have the, the capacity to put back a, a thousand pounds of carbon back into that. But if we till that, uh, we've taken eight, nine hundred pounds of that back into the atmosphere. And that's why we see that uh, steady state or, or the decline in organic matter over time with that. Because even though we've sequestered it back in there, it's fairly fragile. And it's fragile because it's near the surface. Uh, we, we till it and we oxidize it and it's right back into the atmosphere. And so sequestration is only going to occur when we begin to uh, ensure that we have a stable soil environment that allows that carbon to be put into uh, uh, forms that, that are not readily oxidized and also limit the amount of disturbance that we put into a, to a soil surface. And so when we, when we see that, and in fact, uh, when we go and dig uh, pits in long-term plots that have, uh, that have been in no-till or, or uh, improve residue management systems is that it's very interesting to start looking at the aggregates out there because the aggregates are almost like tree rings. <laughs> you begin to see the, the, uh, those layers of organic matter around the aggregate each year uh, as you begin to do this. And so I think there's some real interesting micro things that we could start doing in soils to look at this. But as those soils and those uh, PEDs uh, build up over time is that one of the things that you see in soils is you see roots going down into that. You see the roots layered right up against the, the sides of those uh, aggregates. But in a real, real aggregated soil, not only do you see them laying against the sides of those, you begin to see the root hairs actually go in vertically or, or horizontally uh, into those peds as well. So they're picking up water nutrients out of this from a much different dynamic uh, than, than what we often thought about. So I think a lot of this is, is and you see those are the real high yielding systems that are out there. Uh, and I think there's just a lot of dynamics in all of this whole carbon process. 
but that's why I say it's, it's a carbon process that's linked to a water process, to, it's linked to a nitrogen process. You just can't think just about carbon. You've got to bring all the other components along with you.